Hello my friends and welcome to the Curate Study. Come in and take a seat for this our Wondering Wednesday. And today I've been wondering about the Da Vinci Code. Now, if you haven't read the Da Vinci Code, spoiler alert, I'm about to give you some details. So it is a book by Dan Brown and actually it's a brilliant book. And the plot roughly summarised, I'm not going to give you all of it because it's quite complicated, is this. There is a secret organisation that exists throughout the world that covers up or protects the fact that Jesus was married. And not only was he married, that he, Mary Magdalene, his wife, had a child. And the Holy Grail, which people had long assumed to be the book, uh, the um, cup used in the Last Supper, is in fact not that at all. The Holy Grail is the receptacle of his bloodline, a descendant of Jesus Christ. Now, the book also involves a cryptologist, the hero of the book, um, who is, needs to track down a series of clues hidden in art and uh, monuments, etc., created by, you guessed it, Da Vinci, hence the name of the book. And at the beginning of Dan Brown's books, what he quite often does is he includes a page or several pages where he lists the details of his books that he claims to be facts. Um, he, I recently looked at another book of his called The Lost Symbol. He does exactly the same in this and he does it in the Da Vinci Code. So what does Dan Brown claim to be facts in the Da Vinci Code? Well, here's a rough list of them. There are more, but these are the ones I'm going to cover in this short film today. First of all, he makes the claim that the, uh, the bloodline of Jesus is a fact because in 325, the Roman emperor, who was a Christian, Constantine, called a conference. And at that conference in Nicaea, he and a group of other early church leaders decided which books would be in the New Testament, which gospels, which accounts of Jesus's life would go in the New Testament. And he arranged for many others to be burnt. And the criteria for the burning or the inclusion was the ones that were burnt were ones that um, um, emphasised Jesus's humanity and pointed towards the fact that he was married. And the ones that were included were ones that basically made Jesus seem less human and more divine. So that's one of the things that uh, Mr. Brown claims in his book. The second thing he claims to be a fact is that uh, amongst a great many other documents discovered uh, in the Dead Sea or near the Dead Sea at a place called Qumran, Gospels were found which indicate that Jesus was married and actually explicitly say that Jesus is married. So what do we make of this? Is this a huge challenge to our faith as Christians? Is this something that we need to immediately run out and research? Well, the first thing to make clear is in the last 2000 years since the death of Jesus, tens of thousands of scholars from many different countries have studied the Bible and documents relating to it. Now, some of those men and women will have been Christians. So perhaps if you were inclined to, you could allege that therefore that they would be biased. But a great many of them, in fact, are also not Christians or some of them are agnostics, some of them are atheists. So we have a huge wealth of information about the documents in the Bible and what, the, what extra biblical documents that have been found since the death of Jesus. So what do we know about Constantine? What do we know about the, uh, the conference of Nicaea in 325? Well, we know quite a lot, actually, because we have letters and documents written by people who attended, who were there. And one thing is absolutely clear, there was not discussion or the conference was not called to discuss the contents of the Bible. It wasn't. The, uh, in Nicaea, the church elders who gathered there were, had been called by Constantine to settle a matter of doctrine. What they wanted to do was to examine who Jesus was. Was he divine or was he human? Was he created? Uh, by God or, or was he coexistent with God and as a result of the conference Christians today still say in church the Nicene Creed 
which is a, a statement of faith that sums up our attitude to Christ's divinity. There was no discussion of what was going to go in the New Testament or the Old Testament. And in fact, that had largely been decided. And with what we call the canon of the scripture had been used. The books that were in the Bible, the 66 books that were in the Bible, had more or less been decided by that point. Some years, actually, even before Constantine was born. And, there, and those books were commonly in use by the majority of churches around the world. So that's fact one debunked. So what can we say about these scrolls found on the Dead Sea? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were initially discovered um, in caves near Qumran by a shepherd in the 1940s. And then in the next one and a half decades into the 1950s, there were excavations by archaeologists and a huge wealth, a treasure trove of documents were found, many of them in, in uh, jars, some of them still intact, some of them in a bit of a poor state. And since that time, scholars have spent thousands and thousands of hours, lifetimes, in fact, examining them. None of them, not one of them, refer to the New Testament. Not one. There are no Gospels there. There is no conversation, no discussion, no evidence about Jesus's life. All of the documents found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to the Hebrew Bible. That is a small part of what we now call the Old Testament. So that's fact number two. Now, on a broader point, there have been documents, uh, Gospels, discovered um, in the time since Jesus died, um, more recently, actually, that uh, discuss Jesus's life. Other Gospels, um, extra canonical Gospels, ones that are not included in the Bible. Of all of those, only one mentions the fact that Jesus might have been married. So in the Gospel of Philip, um, there is comment that Jesus at some point kissed Mary Magdalene. And some people have said, ah, this, the, the Gospel of Philip mentions Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene on the mouth and the other disciples being very upset by this. But in reality, that's not what the Gospel says at all. The gospel says that Jesus kisses Mary Magdalene. It doesn't say he kisses her on the mouth. But actually, if one was being entirely logical, if Jesus had been married to Mary Magdalene, as Dan Brown alleges in his book, why would the other disciples, the apostles, have been upset by this? Doesn't seem logical, does it? But it's been a perfectly reasonable thing for a married man to do. So. The only gospel that mentions Jesus being married is one that was presented to a, an academic institution in uh, 2012. And it is the gospel of Mary's wife, of uh, Jesus's wife. Um, uh, you can see where I'm going to go with this, perhaps. Um, now, that was a, a gospel which specifically mentions Jesus being married, um, presented to an academic institution in 2012. By 2016, the document had been subject to radiocarbon dating and was discovered to be uh, medieval in nature. Um, and the actual writing of this, so the actual document itself, the, the papyrus, was discovered to be medieval in origin. And scholars uh, who um, are best placed to know have now decided that, in fact, the actual writing on it is a forgery copied from another document. So... There's no, uh, even the professor who was involved in its presentation to the original academic institution conceded in 2016 that it was quite probably a fake. So what are the broader point? What should we make of the fact, the allegation that the, the Gospels that are included in the New Testament were specifically chosen to make Jesus appear more, more divine and less human? Well, perhaps a good start would be to read those Gospels. Because Matthew, Mark and Luke, the earliest of the three Gospels, have very little reference to Jesus' divinity. And in fact, it is only in John that a full exploration of what it means that Jesus is divine is undertaken. So clearly that isn't true either. Why were the Gospels that are in the Bible chosen to be in the Bible? And why were others rejected? Well, it's easiest to understand, perhaps, in degree of uh, in, in, in their timeline and in the aspect of when they were written, because the Gospels that are included in the Bible that we currently use today are the ones that were written soonest after Jesus died 
all four of them in fact being written probably between 30 and 40 years after Jesus died. The gap between Jesus' death and the others that we have been found since is considerably larger, at least in the nearest of cases being several hundred years and in some cases being four or five hundred years or more. So to get the most accurate picture of Jesus' life, it seems sensible that we refer to the documents written most recently about him. OK, so in summary, what have we learned? Well, in su perhaps if we want to learn something about the life of Jesus, we should start with one book. This one, the Bible. And then having read that, we're best placed to do some other research. I can highly recommend, if you like, if you want to read more about the Da Vinci Code, a book by Bart Ehrman, uh, who is a professor who's written probably two or three dozen different books on a range of subjects. And he has specifically addressed the controversy in the Da Vinci Code uh, in a book that he has written examining all of the claims that Dan Brown makes. And Mr. Erb, or Professor Ehrman is not a Christian. He is, in fact, an atheist. So if you don't, won't take my word for it, take his. I hope you've enjoyed this special on the Da Vinci Code. In coming weeks, we're going to look at some other sort of theological based subjects, move away from some of the church governance, which has perhaps got a bit heavy for some people. Might well do a, a, um, a short film on suffering. I think it's something that Christians need to really dig into and understand. So something along the lines of why would an omnipotent God allow suffering to occur? Then maybe we'll look at the value of prayer. Does God answer all our prayers? I hope you've enjoyed being with me here today in the Curate Study. Until we meet again, my friends, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. <laughs>